mierda! ¡Bonita! Okay, we'll start with this. A Twitter account that goes by the name Boxing Kingdom says, Clarissa Shields has released screenshots of private messages that show Amanda Serrano recognizing her as the Guo. She posted screenshots of what was an amicable exchange. Private correspondence online, and this is being interpreted as a response. A response to Jake Paul, who promotes Amanda Serrano, calling Amanda the quote. The greatest woman of all times. Phrase she claims to have coined herself, even though all she's really doing is borrowing it from Muhammad Ali. The GOAT, the greatest of all times, all she did was add a W to call herself the greatest woman of all times. You're not original. So what do I think about Clarissa Shields publicly posting private correspondence between her and Amanda Serrano based on Jake Paul calling her the quote. I think she's petty, I think she's insecure, and I think in spite of her accolades, that's why people don't like her. They just pretend to online. Yeah, online where they can kiss her ass and it doesn't cost them anything, they just don't show up in the numbers to her fights, or the metrics, the viewing figures, that it's not genuine, lending itself to Clarissa Shields' insecurities. And rest assured, she is a very insecure individual in spite of being very accomplished as an amateur and a professional when you're so easily set off. Because a promoter is promoting his fighter. That's what Jake Paul is in all of this. He's Amanda Serrano's his promoter. You posted private correspondence between you and her, her who you claim you don't have a problem with, though your actions tell another story. You're envious. You're jealous. You know you're jealous. I'm not gonna pull any punches. You're jealous of her because she gets knockouts and you don't. She makes more money than you do and more people like her. People really don't like you. So when Jake Paul calls her the greatest woman of all times as if you've got a patent on that phrase, of course it's gonna set you off. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. I never saw her. Katie Taylor. She's got a way better resume than Clarissa. So attention starved and demanding that she be recognized as the greatest woman of all times. I never saw Amanda Serrano. She doesn't do that either. Cecilia Breakhouse in her day, she didn't do that. Go figure that it's the fighter that campaigns in the weakest divisions, in the weakest weight classes, with the most tepid and shallow talent pools that demands she be recognized as the greatest woman of all times for fighting less than everybody else in weaker divisions. Against weaker opponents. Clarissa's rationale is that she's never been beaten. Unlike Katie Taylor and unlike Amanda Serrano, I guess that's what's supposed to make her the greatest woman of all times? That she never lost. Did you forget who you're borrowing that phrase from? The greatest woman of all times? The greatest of all times? Muhammad Ali? That's who you got that from. Where you got that from? And Muhammad Ali was not unbeaten. Muhammad Ali did not leave the sport with an unbeaten, unblemished record. He lost a couple of fights. Are you saying that he's not the greatest of all times because he lost before? Huh? You're the quote because you never lost. That's what you're saying. You're equating your unbeaten record to you being the greatest woman that ever did it. But the guy that you're modeling yourself after didn't have an unbeaten, unblemished record. He won some fights and he lost some fights. Muhammad Ali isn't considered the greatest of all times because he left the sport with an unblemished record. He's considered the greatest of all time because of who he fought and when he fought them. In that way, Katie Taylor has a more legitimate claim towards being the greatest woman of all times based on who she fought compared to who Clarissa fought. Oddly enough, Katie doesn't demand that she be recognized as the greatest woman of all times because she's not as insecure as Clarissa. It's about who you fight, not whether or not you got a perfect record. Claiming that it is disrespectful of Amanda's team to use a phrase 
that she coined, but you're using a phrase that someone else coined. Are you related to Muhammad Ali? That you think you're so original and you're gonna gatekeep the claim as being the greatest woman of all times and everybody's supposed to just lie down and accept it. I don't think Clarissa's the greatest woman of all times for competing in barren weight classes. It's that much easier to look dominant and stay unbeaten when there's barely anybody to fight where you fight. And don't start up about how you won two gold medals in the Olympics when the only reason you even got to fight for gold medals is because of Katie Taylor. She's a big part of the reason that women boxers were allowed to box in the Olympics for gold medals. I used to chalk up these behaviors from Clarissa as being hyper competitive because she's an Olympian, but the more I look at it, it's not because she's an Olympian, it's because she's a glory hog. Nobody can do nothing around this broad without her making it about herself. Because she's so insecure. So starved for attention. Do you think it's a coincidence that Amanda Serrano fought this past weekend, knocked the girl out the way Clarissa can't knock anybody out so that the following morning she could post this? She's a glory hog. She's trying to steal Amanda's thunder. Aggrandizing herself at the expense of everyone else as if you can strong arm public opinion. For the few that go up to bat for Clarissa Shields, there are that many more that would go up to bat for Amanda or Katie. That she wishes to fly off the handle because Amanda's team consider her the greatest woman of all times. If you ask them, she's the best. What, were they supposed to say you're the best? Were they supposed to say your name? You gotta watch yourself around somebody like Clarissa. You're never really friends with somebody like that. You gotta watch yourself. It might seem like she wants you to do well, but she doesn't want you to be doing better than her. And as soon as you are, her true colors are gonna come out. She's a glory hog. Nobody can do nothing without her making it about herself. In men's lightweight news, Isaac Cruz yearns for another shot at Gervonta Davis with a full training camp. Lest we forget the first time out, Isaac was little more than a late replacement standing in for Roly Romero, who had some legal woes that he had to take care of, which saw him pulling out of the fight. Isaac Cruz catapulted his career from a middle-of-the-pack contender into a heralded commodity in 2021 when he came in as a late replacement opponent and gave knockout artist Javante Davis all he could handle in a close decision loss. Pitbull proved that a fighter can evolve into a star even in defeat. Heralding the end of the Mayweather era and overemphasis on the O, the unbeaten record, and the performance led to four straight appearances as a co-featured attraction on pay-per-view bouts. The most recent one in March being an eighth round stoppage against Rolando Romero to capture his first world title. Cruz, 26-2-1 with 18 KOs, will be showcased again on a mega card when he defends his WBA super lightweight title for the first time against Jose Valenzuela on August 3rd. As the co-main event to Crawford versus Madrimov, the show will take place at the BMO Stadium in Los Angeles on DAZN, ESPN, and PayPerView.com. It will be headlined by the junior middleweight championship between Terence Crawford and Israel Madrimov, along with a performance by rap star Eminem. Just like Eminem is known for a hit list of cult classics, the 26-year-old Mexican fan favorite, Cruz, is quickly becoming known for his cult following. I'm I'm really happy about how fans come to see me cruise tote boxing scene. My hard work and dedication have led me to where I am now, where the fandom in LA can feel that I am the people's main event. I will continue to work hard, make sure I keep earning that, and give the fans what they want come fight night. I don't see unification matches being part of Isaac's future. For all this talk about giving the fans what they want, I think a lot of the fans would like to see some unification matches at 140 since all the champions there are standing apart. He's not going to unify with anybody. I give everything I have. I have every day in training camp so I can perform at my peak every time I am in front of the fans. I leave my heart in the ring every time and boxing fans see and feel it. That's why they love me. Whether it is one round or 12 rounds, I will come prepared and make sure the fight is a spectacle. The 5 foot 4 inch power punching Cruz has been billed as the Mexican Mike Tyson and pegged as the next great Mexican pay-per-view draw after Canelo Alvarez. Cruz said he's ready to parlay pit bull mania and start headlining his own pay-per-view shows moving forward. And maybe he can, so long as he stays in the winner's bracket. The issue is that Isaac is a very simple fighter, among pressure fighters. I would say he's a C, maybe a C-plus pressure fighter. So often in the American boxing scene, you hear about the angles they might use to try to sell a fighter instead of the most important one, their ability. How much ability does he actually have? And that's where all of the angling and strategy 
comes in. That's why he's not going to try to unify this division, as it would throw a serious monkey wrench into all their plans for pit bull mania and trying to parlay that and do pay-per-view success. Isaac says, I trust my management team to decide what's next for me. Cruz is signed to Manny Pacquiao's promotional company. Lifelong boxing executive Sean Gibbons serves as Cruz's manager, and PBC head Al Heyman advises Cruz and has showcased him on PBC shows ever since the fighter made his U.S. debut in 2019. It's been two years since he fought Gervonta Davis, and you can't really say he fought anyone of note unless you want to count Roly Romero. Unless you think Roly is a good fighter, which I don't know. In the two years that have followed his points decision loss to Gervonta, he's turned down fights with Ryan Garcia, walked away from a mandated fight with Shakur Stevenson. They're selective because they have to be. They've got big plans for Isaac, and it would throw a serious monkey wrench in their plans if they threw caution to the wind and exposed him to the rest of the 140 pound division. For that reason, I don't expect he's gonna unify. He's not gonna fight Teofimo. He's not gonna fight Liam Bato or Alberto Pueyo. He is not going to try and unify this division and it's for that reason, I'm really not that excited about him. I know what's about to happen. They have to leverage Isaac's ability or the lack thereof against what opponents might upset him, what opponents might beat him. And that's a lot of people. All he's done at this weight is beat Roly, and Roly did next to nothing at this weight. You're all doing a round robin between yourselves and Javante Davis inside of this little bubble, this biosphere. I don't know if Davis is afraid or not to face me in a rematch, but what I do know, with the right training camp and the right preparation, if I face Gervonta again, I can give him a big surprise, said Isaac. Is anyone surprised that what Isaac is really gunning for is a rematch with Gervonta Davis so that they can keep pretending they're the best in show by jerking each other off? We now know Gervonta's not fighting Loma later on this year. <laughs> Loma's not motivated, which leaves the door open for a rematch that I wasn't asking for. No, I don't think Gervonta and Isaac need to fight again, but they do. So if Isaac Cruz beats the 25-year-old up-and-coming southpaw, Rayo Valenzuela, in front of what should be a significant Mexican crowd, roars for a rematch clash with Davis will only get louder. Roars? What roars? Who's demanding they fight again, besides them? Life is all about changes, said Cruz. If Valenzuela feels he can be a champion, he has to take challenges with the toughest guy out there. Valenzuela is one of the toughest guys out there, too. And that gives me a lot of respect. I'm welcoming the challenge. He's a worthy opponent. No, he isn't. There's literally a mandatory challenger in the queue that this article doesn't mention. Ishmael Barroso, who knocked out O'Hara Davies to become the WBA's mandatory challenger. And instead of fighting him, you defend an 140 pound title against a guy from 135. The article says that Cruz's master plan is to participate in title unification fights, with 140 pound belt holder Teofimo Lopez leading the bunch, and then resume his career once again as a lightweight. It's just talk, he's not gonna do that. I wanna stay at 140 pounds for my two year plan, and I may go back down to 135, but for now, I'm a 140 pounder, said Cruz. I want to face the other three champions to unify the division. It all depends on who is up for the challenge. That's what it will take for me to get to the next level and become the next super pay-per-view star. They're all up for the challenge. If it's afforded to them, I'm pretty sure Alberto Pueyo would like to fight Isaac and Teofimo and Liam Bado. But that's not who I expect Isaac to fight if he beats Ryo. No, if he beats Ryo, I expect he's gonna fight Javante again, which is what I always expected. Because I was never sold that the Lomachenko fight would happen, not with Javante, and I'm not sold that Isaac is gonna risk derailing all the progress he's made for a Pueyo, a Bottle, or a Lopez. They're thinking of themselves will make more money fighting Javante again. Isaac is gonna fight Javante again. It's all so predictable. But what I didn't predict and what I didn't expect is that Vasil Lomachenko would withdraw, citing a lack of motivation. And for that, he's now come under fire. He's being criticized by former unified champion Julian Williams, who said, I only logged in to read the Lomo backlash for choosing to take time off instead of fighting Tank Davis in a super fight. Because if the shoe was on the other foot, 
Never mind. That's what J Rock said. J Rock must have been living under a rock for several years because for several years the shoe was on the other foot. Did you criticize Javante Davis or Floyd Mayweather for putting this off in 2017, in 2018, in 2019? Tell the whole story, why don't you? Guys like you can't, because if you did, it would be a bit hard to criticize Vasil Lomachenko for now walking away from that fight when he pursued it for years, and for years it was Team Davis putting it off. So let's just cut the crap and call a spade a spade. I don't want to sugarcoat anything. The real problem that some people have had with Vasil Lomachenko for years stems from two things. Two things primarily. One, that he pursued Gervonta Davis for years, making him look bad and making him subject to criticism. That's one. Two. What some people really don't like about Vasil Lomachenko, if there seems like there's something else there, something more, that they don't like about him, though they're not saying it, is that he's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Ukrainian who can box. Tribalism. There are a lot of people right here in the American boxing scene that don't like this fighter for no reason other than how he looks and where he's from. That's what it is. But they don't say it openly because if they did, that would make them subject to those same kind of criticisms. And the fighters that they support, the fighters they like. This is not about Loma fans keeping the same energy. I'm a Loma fan, and I think he should have retired right after the Cambosos fight. What are you sticking around for? If you don't get out of bed for a fight like this, I don't think anything's gonna get you out of bed, at which point you shouldn't hold up the division holding up the IBF title. That's what I think. So this is not about Loma fans keeping the same energy for Loma that they kept for Javante. This is about Javante Davis fans not keeping the same energy for Javante that they are now keeping for Loma. You want to criticize Loma all of a sudden for not prioritizing this fight when for years Gervonta and his team didn't prioritize this fight. And at any point in there, did you criticize them? No, you didn't. Because what you really don't like about the solo Machenko, what you really don't like about this character is he's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned guy from the Ukraine. You don't like him on the premise of where he's from and how he looks. And you don't want that rationale turned against you by saying it openly, because if you do... Well, then it's fair game. You don't want it to be fair game. Pretending that Gervonta Davis would have somehow been victimized? If the shoe was on the other foot. The shoe literally was on the other foot, and I didn't see you piping up about it. You just project your own character flaws and inadequacies on other people, because underneath it all, that's what you're doing! Like when Ryan Garcia said he suspected Oscar Duarte was using steroids? Come to find out, Ryan was the one on banned substances! It's called projecting. And what J-Rock, what Julian Williams is doing, is projecting. You're pretending that people are biased towards Vasil Lomachenko. No, you're just biased to Gervonta Davis. You turned a blind eye to them putting off this fight and didn't say anything about it. But now you want to criticize Vasil Lomachenko when he does the same thing? You know what the difference is? He's courting retirement. Was Gervonta courting retirement in 2017? Was he courting retirement in 2018 and 2019? Was he thinking about walking away from the sport? No. So I'm not going to say that because you're a hypocrite trying to accuse others of being hypocrites. You're only projecting your own character flaws on everybody else. Rules for thee, but not for me? That's the mentality. 